Greetings War Thunderers, this is Longshot with you again, and welcome to another video in my Analyze This series. This one will feature some excellent flying and exceptional gunnery skills, along with a German team showing how not to fly 109s and 190s. As you can see it's a realistic battle, but there's plenty to learn here for arcade players as well. It was sent by Dan Val who writes, Longshot, please look at my recent game flying the Griffin Spitfire Mark 14E. It's a six kill game, I kinda carried the team, however we ended up losing after I got wrecked by a 190 at the end. I think I need to work a bit on my spatial awareness. It might also be beneficial to look at the guy who came first on the other team, as he also got six kills and flew very well. And before I begin I should mention that Dan Val is now a member of my squadron, however I first met him in an arcade battle while filming my A6M2 tutorial video. If you're curious to see how that turned out, there's a link on your screen, which you can click if you have annotations enabled. Anyway, before I get started, just in case there's newcomers watching who haven't yet seen my Analyze This videos, let me explain what it's all about. The idea is that I examine replays contributed by viewers, analysing what they did right, but also looking at mistakes they may have made, and pointing out areas in which they might improve. If you've ever been shot down and wondered how the hell did that happen, then that's the kind of situation I'm looking to cover in these videos. In doing so I'm hoping it'll be helpful to all of us in learning to recognise and avoid mistakes and thereby improve our flying. It's also a good opportunity to showcase the abilities of different pilots and highlight the things that they did well, which we can take away and try to emulate ourselves. Lastly, please understand that if I do make critical comments in these videos, it's never my intention to belittle or ridicule the player who submitted the replay. Indeed, they should be praised for their willingness to expose their flying like this for the benefit of everyone who watches. Unfortunately, I'm also having to work around shortcomings in War Thunder's replays. They don't show essential information such as ammunition, fuel, coolant temperature, throttle settings and other manual engine controls. There's no blackouts or redouts from G-forces and half the time you can't see the markers of enemy planes. And I could easily get carried away with a bit of, bit of a rant on why it's taking so long for Gaijin to improve this aspect of the game. Perhaps that's best left for another time, so I'll focus on the battle instead. Dan Val's climbed up to around 5,000 metres, and quite a few of his team have also climbed, which is always a promising sign. And as I speak, the first enemies are appearing through the cloud, starting with this 109. It's very important at this stage of the, of the game to be scanning the skies for dots, as markers are no longer present from 10 kilometres or more out like they used to be in realistic battles. The last thing you want is to engage the first plane you see, and then be ambushed by several enemies because you failed to spot them beforehand. Anyway, this is either the only target Dan spotted so far, or the other enemies may have been out of range, so he dived to engage. But the 109's dropped into the cloud, and Dan's decided not to follow, and very gently lifts his plane into a climb, thus preserving his speed and making sure G-forces don't rip his wings off, which is always something to be careful of with most Spitfires. OK, the 190's a new target. Looks like he's after the friendly F7F, so Dan continues to climb while watching the situation, building an altitude advantage on the 190 and waiting for the opportune moment to attack. OK, here we go. Into a dive as the 190 turns horizontally, and that turn cost him quite a bit of speed and has allowed Dan to close in quickly. Still not quite in gun's range, and Dan's fired a bit of a burst from the machine guns. And now he's closing in and he lets him have it from close range. Kill number one in the bag. Again gently into a zoom climb, and for the first time in a little while Dan looks around. If I had a, critici a criticism so far, it's that Dan gets a bit overly focused on a target when he's about to engage. It just feels like too much time went past then between checks of his six, or looking around at the air above him and, and sweeps of the horizon as well. And so far in this game that hasn't been a problem, but it's so easy to be blindsided by a plane you never saw approaching. And especially in a cloudy game like this, you need to be really vigilant, as planes can so easily sneak up on you. Anyway, Dan spent a couple of minutes looking for targets, but one by one they all dive through the clouds, so eventually he realised he needed to do, to do the same. And once through the clouds, he discovered quite a few planes down here. It seems the battle had simply gravitated to ground level. Note how gently he's pulling out of that dive. If the Mark 14E is anything like other spits I've flown in RB, it'd be so easy to snap a wing right now. Okay, having assessed the situation, there's a 190 directly beneath that's just asking to be dived at, and Dan's happy to oblige. Not to take anything at all away from Dan's achievements in this battle, but on the whole this is a really bad German team. Look at all of those lawn mowing fighters. 
They have squandered whatever speed they had, so when a superior dogfighting plane catches them with an energy advantage, there is nothing they can do. As illustrated there with the 190 being helpless to escape Dan's accurate close range burst. Even if the battle does descend to lower altitude, imagine if those 109s and 190s were sitting up there beneath the cloud layer, they'd be a significant threat, and indeed one Dan Val needs to be aware of in case there's a competent pilot on the enemy team who hasn't dived all the way out yet. Anyway, Dan's regained some altitude and is on the hunt for new targets. And the tracer from the AA guns reveals the presence of a 109, flying at ground level, of course. Dan builds on his altitude advantage as a second 109 pops into view, and he's grass, uh, grass cutting as well. One thing Dan hasn't done for a while is another 360 degree camera sweep. If there was a German fighter in the clouds, it'd be so easy to be bounced right now, even as Dan's concentrating on the targets below. All it'd take would be for one of those low fighters to target select Dan's plane, and he'd be visible to the hunter in the clouds who could swoop down for the kill completely undetected until it was too late, just like Dan's doing to this hapless 109 which he caught low and slow with nowhere to go. Again, that was a beautiful trigger discipline uh, display there, getting into point-blank range and dropping the target with short bursts. It was hard to see as there was no icon on the plane, but while Dan completed that loop, a 190 did indeed drop out of the clouds to attack the F-82. He's extended away to the left of screen as Dan tries for a rather ambitious intercept on this 109. It's not going to work. No luck that time, and Dan extends in the direction of that boom and zooming 190, and there he is, coming back for another pass at the twin Mustang. The Dora soon had second thoughts, perhaps seeing the Spitfire or hearing the machine guns as Dan tried some long range bursts. He could probably have escaped if he kept up his speed and ran away, instead he's going into an ill-advised zoom climb, a mistake that Dan quickly makes him regret. OK, that just leaves the low altitude 109, who's trying for a head-on. After a brief burst, Dan snap rolls out of the way, then into a split S to gain speed, while turning toward the 109, hoping for a snapshot from underneath. 109, the 109 hasn't turned at all though, and as he veers to the left it's obvious he now has a speed advantage and he can simply extend away if he wishes. He cannot however run away from the twin Mustang, which is closing in on the 109 from behind and above the Spitfire. There he is. And as the F-82 forces the 109 to take evasive action, he loses his speed advantage over Danvale, and instead of being left behind, Dan's Spitfire is now catching up. The 109 is forced to turn to shake off the F-82, which can't follow him, but that sets him up for Dan to attack on a nice deflection angle, but unfortunately his shots go wide. We're now into a bit of a scissors, which really is the final straw for the 109, and Dan pulls up into a high yo-yo, and now the 109's out of options. In fact he seems just to give up at this point, simply flying straight which makes him quite an easy target to finish off. So that's five kills and the ace in the day, but the German team is not beaten yet. As Dan heads to the closest airbase to refuel and rearm, let's see who's left. A G6 and a D13, who've probably returned to base themselves. On Dan's team, only a B17 and the Tiger Cat remain, I'm not sure what happened to the twin Mustang. The B17 is unlikely to be of any help of all, at all, and the Tiger Cat's a bit of an unknown, we haven't seen it in the battle. And let me take this opportunity to congratulate Dan for his gunnery skills in this game. He's using stealth on the machine guns, and I presume air targets built for the cannon, so he's firing completely without tracer. It'd be so easy to spray your shots around and waste ammunition, and obviously stealth makes it harder to hit your target, but Dan had no trouble dropping five planes. He used the machine guns at longer range and saved the cannon for short bursts at point blank when he had the firing solution perfectly lined up. Anyway, we're back in the air, flying straight toward the enemy side of the battlefield. And this is quite often an interesting stage in a realistic battle. We don't know where the enemy are. Perhaps they're still at their airfield, or maybe they reloaded earlier and are even now climbing overhead with a significant energy advantage. Anything's possible, and Dan's decided that discretion is the better part of valour, and he's climbing uh, to the side, 
and a quick glance at the stat sheet would have shown Dan that the D-13 had three kills to this point, so at least one of the enemy pilots is likely to be more of a threat than the hapless lawnmowers he dispatched earlier on. Looking back at his teammates, the F-7F has climbed a little, but is taking a more direct approach toward the enemy. He hasn't tried to link up with Dan, and the B-17 is lumbering straight toward the nearest ground targets. It doesn't take long for the first enemy plane to appear, the 109 with what looks like a significant altitude advantage. Dan immediately turns away to try and buy himself time to climb, but the F-7F has no qualms about trying to engage an enemy fighter flying possibly 2,000 metres above him. If it was just the 109 Dan had to worry about, you could perhaps be critical here and say he should have tried to help his teammate out, but the chances are the D-13's up there as well. Dan has no option but to keep climbing and watch, while the Tiger, Kate, uh, Tiger Cat meets his fate. In fact, there's a dot diving out of the clouds at the Tiger Cat now, so knowing the D-13's location, Dan's finally free to turn toward the enemy. The Tiger Cat takes the only option available, which is to dive, but the D-13's landed some hits and the F-7F's fate is sealed. And very soon, Dan will be alone against two enemy fighters. And because he side-climbed, he'll be engaging them with an altitude advantage. The only problem is that the D-13 is no longer in view. Just can't see the dot for his plane. The logical assumption is that he switched straight onto the B-17. Indeed, there is his dot, diving toward the B-17, and in a few seconds we'll see the tracer as he opens fire. And with that, the D-13 earns his ace in the day as well. OK, Dan has a few options here. The door is about 7 kilometres away, and he's got the BF-109 now at low altitude, munching on the airfield's AAA. So what should he do? If he could kill the 109 quickly before the door arrives, then that eliminates the possibility of being double teamed. But he'd have to be quick, else the door could use that time to either intercept him or gain an altitude advantage of his own. However, it's not always easy to kill planes quickly in RB, and we know the 109's no threat, whereas the Dora certainly is. If it were me, I'd be flying toward the Dora right now, to get above him and look to drive him to the ground. Once again, the Dora has disappeared from view, but Dan seems to have taken his eye off the ball here. Despite the risk the Dora poses now that 30 seconds have passed since the B-17 was killed, Dan's going to dive right down to ground level and engage the 109. Down he goes, throwing away the altitude advantage he patiently built after taking off from the airbase, and although he drops the 109, he's played right into the Dora's hands. There he is, sweeping him from behind, and making no mistake. Obviously there was an error of judgement here. In this situation he needed to prioritise the threat rather than go for the easy kill. But even having made that mistake, he still had the opportunity to, to save the situation before it was too late. Here's that sequence again and I want you to note how often Dan looks around. He's tracking the 109 down at the airfield and then he glances briefly in the direction from which the D-13 is approaching. There's no icon or dot, though of course it is possible that the icon was visible in game and just not shown in the replay, but for reasons I'll show you later, I don't believe the doorway was in fact visible at all at this point. Now he's back to watching the 109, who's still shooting up ground targets, then into the dive, still focused on the 109, still watching the 109. Yes, he stays fixated on the 109 until he shoots it down. This is tunnel vision. It can happen to anyone. And in this case, it allowed the Dora to close in for the kill. Dan did a lot right in this battle. The way he obtained and managed his energy throughout, uh, the gentle handling of the plane at high speeds, and his precise gunnery, all these aspects were exemplary and definitely worth emulating. But he made a crucial mistake in going for the easy kill and ignoring the threat posed by the Dora. He just needed to simply look around more often especially when lining up a target, as that's often when you're at the most vulnerable. Before I finish, it's worth taking a look at things from the Dora's point of view. I'm picking him up after he reloaded at the airfield and climbed above the clouds, and this is around the same time that Dan spotted the 109 about to attack the Tiger Cat. The pilot has seen the F-7F beneath him after it was target selected by the 109 and he's diving to engage. And here is where Dan saw the dot for this plane dropping out of the clouds. He's going to open up at 600 metres, and he walks his tracer onto the target, and down he goes. Now we can't see the icon yet, but Yoli Mondachik, impressive name, but I'll just call him Yoli, has switched straight on to the B-17. I don't have his camera movements, that's me looking to see if Dan Val's visible, which he isn't. 
and given the speed Yoli's travelling at, I don't think he'd be too concerned about a Spitfire at this stage. He circled around a little for a better angle at the B-17, and then swooped to engage. And he's going to make a real mess of this bomber. Oh, the humanity. Okay. By now he would have the advantage of knowing where Danval was. I'm going to point with the cursor at his dot. There. Just clearly visible, just under the clouds. Yoli's performed a gentle turn, still travelling at high speed, and he's deliberately staying low. That will make his plane hard to see against the ground, and his icon won't be rendered either due to the, uh, either due to the way spotting works in RB. He's invisible and he knows it, and he's using it for a high speed, stealthy approach. He flies under the Spitfire now, right overhead, deliberately trying to stay in Dan's blind spot. He's taking a huge risk though, as Dan would have him on toast if he saw him. As soon as Dan dived, Yoli's lifting up for a head-on, but of course Dan hasn't seen him. If he looked now, he'd be able to get away. But from here on it's just too easy. Dan drops down to the 109, which now puts him below Yoli's Dora, and Yoli can simply follow the Spitfire in the dive and pick him off as he begins to climb. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the video. I've certainly learned a lot from it, and I'd especially like to thank Dan Val for sending me the footage. I hope I haven't been too hard on him with my comments, and don't worry, I make plenty of mistakes of my own. If you have a replay you'd like me to consider for this series, uh, please email it to iamlongshot at gmail.com, with a 5 not an S. Make sure to describe what I'm looking for in the replay, and note that I can't promise to review or create a video for every replay I receive. Only the best examples will be considered. Comments are always welcome. If you'd like to support the creation of these videos, there's a Patreon link in the description. Anyway, that's all for this video. And this is Longshot signing off. Until my next vid, I'll see you in the skies.